Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan. Uh, I've been working as a software developer at the STEP for almost two years now. And my name is Nicole, and I've been working uh, in STEP for the past three and a half years. And we're excited to share with you a project we've been working on for the past three months. It's called Zio. Uh, it's a new way to handle employee management using conversational UX. Uh, as, you, as some of you know, conversational UX is a alternative to a graphical user interface. Uh, but in our case, you can view Zio as your friendly, knowledgeable coworker that is always there to help you out. Uh, it integrates with the OpenAI API and Work6, which is another product of ours. It's a company resource and employee management system. And the whole purpose of Zio is to handle the employee management in a conversational manner. Uh, it, it offers a range of uh, technical functionalities, uh, which will help you and your coworkers to enhance your productivity at uh, the work environment. Uh, so let's talk uh, in briefly some of them. Uh, when you want, uh, for example, to take some time, some time off, uh, you can request to leave, paid leave, unpaid leave, or sick leave even. Uh, also, you can see your availability and uh, your colleagues working hours. So it will be much easier for you when uh, you want to find someone uh, when he is available. Also, another important functionality is generating uh, um, a report. Uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, generates SQL queries. We'll talk about this more later. And also, it helps you organize uh, meetings, for example, if you want to create a Google Meet meeting. Uh, and now, let's talk uh, how this exactly works. Yeah, here's an overview of the whole process. We start when a user enters the prompt. Then Zio uses GPT to generate the response. The response can be a text response, in which case we directly state the user. Uh, the other case is uh, a function call. And the function call can be mutated or not mutated. When a function call mutates, that means it changes the user data in some way. We uh, always make sure to display a confirmation prompt. Uh, if the user decides to cancel the changes that we suggest to them, uh, then we ask for further cl clarification, and then the whole process starts all over again. In the cases where the user accepts the suggested changes, or the function is not updating, we send a request to an external API, which in most cases is our uh, platform work six. Uh, in some cases, it can be Google Calendar for organizing meetings, for example. Depending on the response that we get, uh, it can be an error or no data. We uh, display to the user and communicate back to them that there was an error and provide the details uh, about it. In the case where the response is valid, we have two ways to provide it. We run it back to the GPT model to provide it for us, or we format it ourselves. And here to keep in mind that most of the times we choose to format it ourselves, as this helps us cut back on costs and uh, unnecessary API calls and input tokens to the model. And yeah, that's basically the gist of it. Uh, here are some examples. Um, we, we communicate uh, through the Slack UI. Here, an employee uh, wants to take some days off and sends the prompt to Zio. Uh, we have displayed a confirmation dialog. Uh, in this case, the employee wants to take off February 5th and 6th. And we see in the confirmation dialog here, uh, dates are displayed, and we have the option to either approve it or cancel it. In this case, we approve it, so the model sends back uh, a short message saying that the submission was accepted. In these examples, and in the example on the left, uh, we query for the availability of some of our coworkers. In this example, Olivia Brown. Uh, we ask for her availability for the week. Uh, in this case, she can set her availability for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, to be working from 7 to 3 p.m. Uh, in this case, we don't display any confirmation dialog as we, uh, we are just fetching some data from our API and sending it to the user. On the example on the right, however, uh, we are setting our own working hours, in this case, from minus five. And Zio displays um, the, the screenshot was taken on Wednesday, so Wednesday we will be working tomorrow from minus five. It says the changes were from uh, for Thursday to minus five, and the date that uh, the event is going to take place. 
And now I'm going to talk more, more about the reporting functionality. Uh, it's uh, one of the most uh, more important functionalities that uh, this app offers. Uh, so let's uh, explain how this works. Uh, firstly, when the user asks uh, for a report, uh, the model and, inter and uh, Zayu asks uh, for the database schema, uh, which is sent to the model along with the user's uh, request. Uh, the model is tasked, uh, is tasked to generate an SQL query, which is sent back to Zayu. Zayu sends it back uh, to work six, and there we have a special user with read-only access that executes the query. Uh, after the query is executed, if it's successful, the response is uh, returned uh, to Zayu, which uh, handles uh, how it is displayed. Uh, if it's a longer response, a link gets generated, and this, uh, and when the user clicks on the link, uh, it opens in the Zayo uh, interface. If it's a short response with uh, much less data, it is directly displayed in the chat to the user. And if there's an error or something or no data uh, for the, this request, uh, this is communicated back to the user. Uh, so let's see an example for this. Uh, as you can see, I've asked uh, uh, Zayu which employees are members of a specific team. Uh, he asked me to uh, log in to Work6 because I need to be authorized to see this data. After I click on the link and, uh, I, and uh, the authorization is done, the, the model and, and Zayu ask uh, for the database schema. It generates the query. You can see it uh, on the query. And uh, on the bottom of the screenshot, you can see the response that uh, is retrieved from the query. So what were the challenges that we've tackled so far? Uh, the first one being reducing the size of the prompts. Obviously, we want to provide the model with as much information as possible in order for it to make the right decision. But we want to achieve that uh, using as few things as possible. Uh, we do this by this, uh, using descriptive function names and adding additional context only when it's strictly needed, meaning uh, if the model can't decide to call the right function or generate some false parameters, in this case, we provide an additional description. Uh, the number one way we uh, reduce our code and input is grouping functions into scopes. Uh, for example, if you have a group of functions that either uh, fetch availability or be fetched in some way, we group them into an availability scope, which in turn we send to the model, and we send only those functions, not the functions that are not going to be, for example, like functions related to uh, request encoding. In this way, we make sure not only to send as few input talks and tokens as possible, but also we don't confuse the model with unrelated functions. The second one is SQL queries, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, basically, we have views that are uh, much simpler than the actual work six database, and we fetch the database schema only when it's needed, meaning only when we need to generate a SQL report. Uh, in every other case, we don't actually fetch the data, we don't store it in the system code, because this is just unnecessary code usage. Of course, we uh, faced uh, the challenge, uh, some challenges uh, related to security. As I've already said, uh, we had a read-only database user that uh, executes the queries. Uh, this way we prevent SQL injection and, it, and modifying data when uh, we don't want it, uh, the user to be able to modify. Also, you saw in the screenshot that we have confirmation dialogues. If you want to request to leave or, and uh, you mistype something or something like that, it asks you for confirmation so you can be really sure about the changes that you're making. Also, we have a role-based uh, user access control. In Work6, different users uh, have different roles, for example, a payroll or HR or something like that. And uh, users with different permissions uh, can view different uh, types of data. Uh, and lastly, let's talk about uh, identifying names. Uh, when you are having a conversation, even with a bot, you can uh, sometimes ask for information about someone uh, by his first name, full name, or his email. So we wanted to implement a flexible search mechanism to uh, either ask for additional information if uh, it's not enough so he can identify the user or the team project you are talking about. 
uh, or either uh, if you mistype something, you can handle this and not uh, just throw an error. And finally, let's talk a little bit about our future plans. Uh, our number one priority right now, and the thing we're currently working on, is uh, for them to be able to organize meetings. Uh, currently, we're trying to implement this with the Google Calendar, uh, but for future, uh, we would also implement Outlook and other calendars. Uh, number two is experimenting with different models. As I mentioned, uh, as of now, we're only using Jupyter models, uh, so we are open to suggestions if you have some. Uh, Mr. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, we also want to integrate the chat within the Works uh, Web 6 UI because uh, right now it's only a command line interface for get posted and on the uh, and also a Slack UI as we saw in the examples. And last but not least, we want to improve, improve the accuracy of the responses because, as we all know, there's always some room for improvement, especially when working. Uh, AI and Jupyter models. And yeah, that's basically all from us. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>